bunching up instead of maintaining proper spacing between men to reduce potential booby trap casualties. All kinds of things the troops were doing wrong that got extra people hurt and killed because they were green. Because they were all new. Because no one had been there for more than a year. Because people were depressed. Because they were upset. Because they didn't want to be in this war. Because they didn't support the war. Because the, they were being... Their hands were tied behind their backs. And they, they were hampered from actually doing anything correct. Because they were fighting the war in the incorrect way. People just didn't care. And that led to even more casualties. For many Americans... For many American units... In this seeming wind-down pardon me, wind-down period of the war, the absence of opposition was welcome. They practiced what was called search-and-evade tactics instead of search-and-destroy, consciously staying out of harm's way. So once, once we decided we're going to start drawing troops down, the troops quit fighting. Search, find the VC, and then don't make contact with them. Don't fight. We passed by the NVA or the VC. They'd be going one way, and we'd be going the other, so we'd just pass them. We didn't want to open fire. Nobody wanted to die. Nobody wanted anything to happen. End quote from a soldier. The men in Army Captain William Paris's unit accepted this pronouncement of Commander in Chief Richard Nixon, who had said the U.S. Army was in Vietnam to support the ARVN. Uh, the Vietnam Army of the South. Any fighting was incidental to helping them, said Paris. Anyone who was in the infantry after November or December 1970 really didn't have much to do. Any fighting that they got into was totally by mistake. So by the end of the war we were looking to just let the South Vietnamese handle it. And we're not going to. So, w wait a minute, are we here to stop communism? and give these people freedom? Or are we here to try to get these people to give themselves freedom? Because it doesn't seem like they're too interested in that. Many officers and NCOs came to consider their primary responsibility to be to return to their men safely, or pardon me, to return their men safely to home rather than to hunt the enemy or carry out a tactical mission. So, they, towards the end of the war, your duty was to keep your men out of trouble and get them all home alive. Okay, we skip about half a paragraph. He occasionally took the platoon into a bamboo thicket and put claymore mines and trip wires all around. The men rested or slept during the stifling afternoon. Quote, after a while we picked up and moved on, Joy said. Interesting way to spend your afternoon in the jungle surrounded by booby traps and explosives. Uh, the best, we skip about a paragraph again, the best means of discouraging the enemy, according to New Zealand's Major Ogilvie, was to do precisely what more and more Americans were refusing to do. Okay, So discouraging the enemy, cutting down on their numbers, uh, reducing their efficiency, reducing what they're able to do. Here's what, here's what the Americans should have been doing, says the New Zealand commander. They should be setting up, quote, dozens of ambushes. Go out by night, on foot. Move by night. Set up the ambush. Stay out there for six, seven, nine, ten days. Be within artillery range and have available air support. Instead of the enemy dominating the ground by booby traps and our fear of going out there, let us dominate it by ambushes. I realize that we're now in a defense posture here, and probably the idea is to restrict casualties. I think we could probably restrict casualties and do this defensive withdrawal by carrying out this large number of ambushes. Now, I st still think that the real root problem is that you're fighting the population. But he has a pretty sound idea there. It sounds good. Um, but I think the root population is that the pardon me, the root problem is that the population itself doesn't have, doesn't, they don't perceive themselves as having any interest in fighting this war. Whoever takes over, the communists or the Americans, either way, what? I mean, they don't, they didn't care to fight for freedom and democracy. Some of them did. 
But even the ones that did, even the ones in the South Vietnamese army, a third of those were VC, according to intelligence. Military intelligence, as you may know, is a contradiction in terms, an oxymoron. Okay, we skip a little bit. If you got shot at, you shot back. That was about it. I wasn't looking to kill anyone if I could help it, says uh, this guy, one of the soldiers. So, there you have an, an idea of what our attitude was as we began to pull out. So, early in the war, very gung-ho and moralistic, but the longer uh, the institution of the army itself was in this war, and the longer the individual soldiers who were there for more than a year, re-enlisted and stuff, were there, the more and more institutionalized got the mentality, came the mentality that we can't win, they won't let us win, we're not allowed to engage on any winnable grounds, it's, we're just being put in the line of fire, and I'm just, I want to go home. And that became everybody's attitude. Now we skip a few pages forward. Um, this guy, Colonel Richard Katar, K-A-T-T-A-R, says, uh, he observed downright incompetent tendencies in the army. He found troops using Bangalore torpedoes, charges shaped to explode upward in order to blow through barbed wire to clear brush for firebase. For a firebase. Walking about without steel helmets and failing to shift crew served weapons, such as howitzers, around the perimeter to confuse the enemy's efforts to pinpoint locations for eventual attack. So they're supposed to move the howitzers constantly. Um, it's, it says it, I may have it outlined for the material to go into the video or not. It says, I think, every few days, every 72 hours, the guns should be moved around the perimeter. Um, because you can tell where the gun has to be from the shots coming in, eventually. They can zero in on it. Um, so, in order to prevent the howitzers being attacked efficiently by the enemy, you've got to move them around. However, just nobody wanted to do it. Just nobody wanted to do it. They just weren't willing to. Um, we skip away, skip six or eight paragraphs, the next page here. Now it talks about the men of the 1st Brigade, 5th Me Mechanized Division. Uh, the men had ignored a fundamental rule by taking shelter in one bunker, by bunching up when they should have scattered. Quote, uh, says uh, Abrams, one of the guys in the outfit, he says, uh, an atmosphere and a climate begin to prevail. And when it comes a certain amount of laxity, it just requires a lot of attention, a Herculean effort to keep alertness up. So, you might think that the soldiers would uh, try to preserve their lives and do the safety stuff and so on, just because their life is at stake. I mean, it's one thing to say uh, that people are, are um, lazy about stuff that takes a while to take effect, you know. People are lazy about stopping smoking because they won't get cancer for 20 years. They're lazy about changing their oil. But would you be lazy about wearing your steel helmet in a, in a war zone? Would you be lazy about moving the howitzers so they couldn't be efficiently attacked? No. No, you wouldn't be worried about those things either. That's how, that's how um, morose the army had become over the years because of the way that they were made to fight it never knowing what they're doing and always taking uh, command from the top and everything's about statistics and numbers and and of course we're winning every time anybody gives a briefing we're winning the war we're winning the war and you just get sick of it and it gets to a point where lives are lost just out of laziness and neglect and if that happened in the American army you can imagine what other militaries throughout history have been like we skip a few paragraphs the training and the motivation of the soldiers had declined and the NCOs, non-combat officers, had been in the army only slightly longer than the soldiers they were supposedly leading. Ware, W-A-R-E, formed quick impressions of his officers. The good leaders had effective units, he said. Average leaders had poor units. A poor leader had a mob on his hands. There were a few... Uh, 